preliminary, so like jump in with questions. If anything comes clear, let me know. Um, but essentially, I'll, I'll have kind of three parts to this. I'll teach you enough law to be dangerous, at least with respect to class action lawsuits. Um, <laughs> and then I'll tell you about what we've done, um, what kind of results we've gotten, and, and where we see things going from here. So let's imagine the, the following real scenario. It's 2010, uh, 210 million gallons of oil is spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, 22,000 businesses have been affected. And um, all these people are seeking legal relief. And there are two issues for the legal system. The first is all of these people have been damaged, but not necessarily in a big way, right? So if you have a bed and breakfast and the tourism industry is down a little bit, you're probably not looking at multi-million dollar settlements and you're probably not going to hire a lawyer uh, to help with this. On the other hand, all of these people have the same claim against the same company, British Petroleum in this case. Um, and so the law is pretty similar. And if you had everybody go out and um, try and bring their own lawsuit, even if they could afford to hire a lawyer, it would completely uh, slow down the legal system. It would be so we need to aggregate legal claims. And that's essentially what class action lawsuits do. They aggregate legal claims. Um, but they're interesting for, for several kind of special reasons that I'll discuss shortly. Um, and if we kind of generalize the BP case, um, in general, a class action lawsuit ha has lots of people who experience a small harm. Um, in the end, there were 100,000 legal claims and uh, the economic impact of the BP oil spill um, was $8.7 billion. And this is pretty typical, really large harm um, spread across lots of people. A lot of lawyers are gonna find out about this harm and they're gonna file class actions. In the BP case, there were 80 different class actions. The lawyers are incentivized because they're going to be paid a portion of the settlement. Um, and so they have an economic incentive to bring these class actions. But then something interesting happens in the class action kind of workflow which is that a judge actually decides who the class is. A judge decides what the definition is that is going to be used to certify the class. And everybody who matches that definition without having to opt in is automatically part of the class. So in this case, it included things about their geography, businesses, and people located around the Gulf, um, and what they did, people in tourism, people in agriculture, and things like that. Um, the other important thing that the judge does is the judge selects one lawyer to be the class counsel, to represent the class as that class's lawyer, um, and to kind of go forward um, with, with the uh, lawsuit. The second important thing that happens in class action lawsuits is that the judge has to approve the settlement, which means that in contrast to the other types of civil litigation which settle and 98% of cases they do settle um, in private and we never know what the settlement is, in the class action lawsuit case, there's a public opinion, a public document that's written by the judge that actually tells us what the settlement is not only that, it tells us where the money is going. So in the BP case, we know that the settlement ended up being $13 billion. The lawyers got $600 million, which worked out to $1,000 an hour. Um, and, and we know this data, and we can work with this data. So armed with this uh, rigorous understanding how many, of class action. How many pounds per hour you say? A thousand. Yeah. But probably more for the partners, because that included paralegal time. Um, and paralegals are paid less. So no. a lot of money. Um, so the incentives are clear, right? Um, so I with this understanding, um, Sandra and I formulated a couple kind of initial research questions. We wanted to... Yeah. Sorry, quick um, additional question. Who, who designed and decided this process? It, so it's kind of designed naturally through the common law system. Um, but the, the modern process uh, was a reaction to various kind of social issues uh, in the 60s. Um, so this process was kind of born in 19... Uh, 66 and, and invented in the United States, uh, partially as a result of uh, school segregation issues. Um, but the, that was the issue, right? We have lots of harm kind of distributed. How do we deal with it? Um, yeah, and so that actually meshes nicely with the research questions. It's unclear whether this is a good way of deterring this kind of distributed harm. We think it might be, um, but no one's really measured it. Um, it's unclear whether the lawyer's incentives are aligned particularly well. Um, and it's unclear whether another structure for funding these things, for organizing these uh, lawsuits might not be better. And so we started thinking about how we might start to answer these questions. And as of last year, there's a data set that might help us do so. So for the first time ever in 360 years of US legal history, someone's actually put the, together the data and made it available to researchers. Um, this isn't just limited to class actions. This is all US law. 6.7 million cases, 40 million pages, um, all scanned in a relatively convenient JSON format um, that we can work with. 
And so what Sandra and I did is we wanted to find all the class actions buried in this data set. Um, and so as an initial approach, we did a combination of word counting and random forest, which worked surprisingly well. It showed us that there are about 13,000 class actions, which seems to work out if you compare it to other research. We're working on more sophisticated word of embeddings and LSTMs, but essentially we want to first find the class actions, and then we want to extract information. Some of the information is obvious, um, like what the what the attorney is and um, how long the case is, uh, <coughs> things like that. Other things are harder to, to figure out, right? Uh, what kind of opinion it is, whether it's a settlement or a certification opinion, and whether it was granted or denied. Um, those things require us to build either a random forest model or something else um, to try and you know, tease out those features. We're working with data augmentation, replacing words with their synonyms. It's a lot of fun um, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, then when we find the information, um, we can try and gain some sort of statistical insight. Um, and I'll present the initial insight um, that we got now. The first question is how long do the things last? Um, and they tend to settle quickly. And this matches our legal intuition. Uh, there's a rule of thumb among lawyers that if you make it through certification, the dispute goes from $20 million to $200 million. The reason is that suddenly, instead of having one plaintiff and one defendant, you have a class of plaintiffs and one defendant, and you have a lot of leverage. And so there's a huge incentive to settle quickly. Um, and we see that reflected in the data. We also see that sometimes these things last for 20 years, um, creating tremendous legal costs, and probably leaving very little for the class at the end because you have to pay the lawyers for all that time. Um, so that's interesting to know about the structure. <laughs> Another interesting thing might be to try and figure out how these lawyers do. And this is a striking graph. So what we did is for each lawyer, we figured out uh, what percentage of the successful certifications, we've heard that this is kind of a big step, um, what percentage of those are they, uh, are they personally uh, responsible for? And you find that 27 or so percent of lawyers are responsible for all successful certifications. The other way to look at that is that 75% of lawyers never win anything. Um, and given that this is kind of a specialized case um, and people spend their whole careers doing it, it's shocking um, that so many lawyers don't seem to be particularly successful. What I found even more shocking, I figured this would be a mistake. Um, we've asked people uh, who are either practicing attorneys in the space or who are academics who engage with the space. It seems that this is actually unsurprising. Um, it seems kind of in line with legal intuition. Most lawyers don't do that well. The concerning thing is that the court is appointing these lawyers, which means the courts seem to be picking lawyers who aren't doing particularly well to represent potentially very large groups of people. Yes. But aren't there just because there are not so many class action lawsuits, right, 17,000, aren't there just a lot of lawyers that do one, and isn't that just most class action lawsuits are not one, and therefore there are just a lot of lawyers that do one or two, which are both not one, and are therefore zero so, percent. Next so, slide, I would say. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but to answer the question, it's like a specialized process, and, and you have some attorneys who bring thousands of these things, um, and or hundreds of these things. So, so there are definitely attorneys who are <laughs> too, kind of got lucky um, because they found the class and they were you know, appointed as class counsel. But for the most part, these are kind of specialists. But if we look at the next slide, um, we can look at for, for each attorney, um, you know, how surprising is the result that we're looking at? So essentially, we, we figured out for each attorney and for each judge, um, how many successful certifications were they involved in? And using like a binomial test, we can figure out how surprising is that. So the right side of the distribution um, are those people who are unsurprising, right? That means that they um, either performed average or uh, below average. They you know, might have been involved in one class action and they lost it, or one class action and they won it. It's not surprising. The left side of the distribution is the surprising side. Those are people who might have been involved in 50 class actions and 49 of them have been won, um, or 50 class actions and 49 of them have been lost. Um, the same is true for lawyers and judges, right? You can think of them in similar ways. The judge sees these class actions, the lawyer brings these class actions. And we want to see like what are the outliers and they're on the left side. And can I ask another yeah. question? Isn't this uh, confounded by sort of industry or specialization that there are just some lawyers that do smoking things that are always won or other things that are always lost? Isn't this more of a topic related thing than a person related thing? Like because now you the claim is quite strong, right? Lawyer A always loses. <coughs> lawyer B always wins, as if the other variables are the same 
for both lawyers and this is what. So if we, if we found that, that would be a good explanation for it. And if we found that, then that would worry us about all the, so securities class actions are exactly an example of this. Um, they're brought every time, like there's a big change in stock prices, someone will bring a class action on behalf of those people who bought um, right before the stock price change, um, or those people who sold right before it went up. Right? Um, and those, those people tend to not win because there's nothing there. Um, but then the question is like, should our legal system allow for those people to bring very expensive um, lawsuits, right? These are thousands of hours of judge time um, that flow into it. And, and should, is this the right structure uh, for, for the legal system? Yeah. Yeah, one question. Do you know if um, how this graph and the previous one compare for like class action lawsuits versus just like other specific kind of no, lawsuits? No, we don't. Um, so this is like the first time that everyone's tried to do this for any, any kind of lawsuit that we're aware of, um, at least with this scale. So people do like 100 or 200 kind of hand level, but it, it would be really interesting to compare. Okay, uh, absolutely. Uh, so maybe this related with the differentiation of the skills, because when you uh, deal uh, with a settle, you are not implying uh, a legal knowledge, but a commercial or gaining knowledge. So it's, it's another skill. And maybe lawyers that are good at law do that, uh, that, that could be true, but again, then we would wonder what, why are we, shouldn't we have some sort of, we have all these you know, hurdles to becoming a lawyer. So maybe then we need to go back to legal education and ask like, are we teaching people the right things? Um, or are there too many lawyers? Or, so this picture seems <laughs> odd. Um, and, and one kind of obvious explanation might also be, well, all those kind of successful lawyers are with all the judges that tend to grant certification. And so we can kind of, yeah. The exact definition of uh, a lien and loss. So whether the certification was granted, did the judge approve a class action to go forward, or did the judge say there's nothing here, go away? Um, and, and like we said earlier, right, that changes the dispute from like a relatively minor settlement to something really big. And so it's a big deal. Um, you can define it differently, uh, but that's that's an intuitive way of defining. Um, and so we tried to match, right? So. Maybe, maybe the judges who are on the bottom, um, sorry, yeah, the judges who are on the bottom um, and the lawyers who are on the top are matched in such a way that the successful lawyers are always working with the friendly judges. And that explains the discrepancy. And so what we did here is we linked um, lawyers who work with judges um, a above average. So if somebody, if there was a lawyer who had five cases and four of them were in front of the same judge, there would be a link here. Um, and these are the 20 uh, kind of most prolific lawyers and 20 most prolific judges, although you get the same picture if you look at the top 200. So we see no systematic connection between the kind of successful lawyers and the friendly judges, and something else is, is going on. Um, and we're- This is over class action. This is over class action. Mm -hmm. So you could have somebody who's like Mr. Anti-Smoking, and he does a lot of things. He's very friendly to things that are smoking, but he doesn't handle the class action. <laughs> Smoking lawyer, I know that he's very friendly to this type of issue. Yes, and you could try and play yeah, that you out. You could take your data and, and sort of look at all the things that the judge handles and try to get a, a grade for them on the topic. Absolutely, even within class actions or beyond class actions, right? So, yeah, yeah, because yeah. this doesn't look like there's much of a There's nothing going on yet. Um, and so that kind of brings us to, to the next steps. And I'd be curious kind of to see what the room thinks, um, where, where this might go. Um, but one obvious place to go is to say, well, these things are meant, these class actions are meant to remedy some sort of social issue. Um, and so let's measure whether they do so, right? Uh, there are class actions that are brought uh, for smoking. There are class actions that are brought uh, for school segregation, for workplace discrimination, <coughs> for securities fraud. Let's see, you know, if a class action actually results in the, in the social impact that expect um, by trying to kind of cross correlate those, uh, those different data sets. Um, another approach would be to try and understand the financial dynamics and to see, you know, what is the expected value of a class action on day one? And what does it depend on? Can we build a factor model um, for that and extract financial data um, from court documents? Um, this is particularly interesting if you think about alternative ways that we could structure these things. Uh, a lot of people propose auctions. So have the lawyer buy out the class on day one, put up their own money, and then they own the legal claim and they get to go fight it and they get the whole settlement, but they have to pay everybody on day one. 
And if they do that, we would expect less frivolous lawsuits, less lawyers who are willing to kind of go down this whole path, having kind of spent potentially millions and billions of dollars. Um, it may be slightly more realistic variation of this if you have a third party financing the lawsuit. Um, and that would have an interesting effect on the way incentives shift. And we can also think about this kind of more globally. We're only looking at the US. So in Australia, this third party financing is the way class actions are done. Um, virtually every major class action is actually funded by some other third party investment firm. Um, and there's actually a publicly traded uh, litigation financing firm in Australia uh, called Bentham that is like specialized in this. That's, that's what they do. Um, in India, class actions are a new invention. They were kind of brought in in 09 um, as a result of a lawsuit that's been dubbed the Indian Enron. Um, and it's interesting to see, you know, in a, in a jurisdiction where you didn't have class actions and now you do, how that might have changed the way people approach um, handling this kind of social impact uh, types of litigation. Um, in Rwanda, there are no class actions um, at all, but people propose that they ought to exist and looking at Rwanda's history, um, maybe this would be a really interesting area for, for class actions to be introduced. And so we can see that, um, you know, what, what is the impact of not having class actions um, on a legal system? What they did in Rwanda in the end is actually, instead of aggregating the claims, they just created more judges. So they appointed people in different villages who were kind of village elders to act as judges. They would meet every Sunday and they would just sentence a bunch of people. Um, so that's how they approached it there. Um, but maybe a class action would have been a better, different way to handle this. Um, the Pacific Islands are yet another example. So groups in the Pacific Islands uh, proposed that there should be a lawsuit brought against the people responsible for uh, rising sea levels because those pose an existential threat on somebody um, living in a remote Pacific Island close to the sea level. And so then the question is, could we have a global uh, class action and how that might look? And, you know, they would presumably play in in the sense that you need to figure out who this class would be and how large it would be. Um, it would also play into uh, trying to figure out who would have jurisdiction and how you would divide that up. Um, so that's kind of exciting and, and interesting areas. I, I have like a couple more minutes if you guys want to ask questions. That's all the content I have. Um, but, but thanks for your time. I have um, one suggestion for you and one second one. So one was is there's probably lots more financial interest than there are anything else. And so the question is, is uh, about impact. You want to be able to do something around the impact around those sort of narrow ones. Like do you think less of this financial fraud uh, versus that one? Because there's more class options here. Is there any evidence for that? Where so there's one data set at Stanford that's kind of kept under close guard, yeah, yeah. Um, but that would help us answer some of that um, because they they have a securities class action clearinghouse. Um, so there's a lot of data there, and if we kind of tried to use that as training data for what we're doing, we might be able to start answering that together with you know time series data of share prices or you know various other things. Yeah. Um, so that would be kind of an obvious way to go after. Yeah, because I mean the big questions people have is is this helping? Right. You know, or is it just a scam or money in the legal profession or or whatever, right? Um, and the other thing is, of course, we have a, a really interesting relationship with Australia. So we, we came up with something that was interesting in the sense that, um, or in particular, that it would promote uh, jobs and the economy and blah, blah, blah. Uh, that uh, they would be interested in contributing data that you might not otherwise do. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know exactly what the question is. Yeah, you'd have to phrase it in a way because it's with the government there, right? So um, it's with the government, but it's a new government, so they don't like screwing the old government. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they probably love it, actually. <laughs> yeah. but, but their big priority is, is that uh, they face uncertain economic times and they want to have more people, more jobs, and people who can plan those for a long time. So if you can point out something that's a data-driven innovation that would help them achieve that goal, they certainly be willing to help. Maybe the Rwanda model and have like local charges in all the villages, huh? <laughs> that will give some jobs. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you, have you done a kind of category breakdown yet for financial and products liability, environmental. But that would be a good place to do. Yeah, that would be the next thing I, I would do and then look at
basically run the analysis again by category and see what you see. Yeah, yeah I think that makes a lot of sense because you, because you're going to have these sort of networks of people, everybody's eco or tobacco or whatever. It's sort of hard to think of. So. It, it may also um, spark ideas about other data sets or other dimensions you could add to it to see things like impact. I mean, another thing actually might be um, over category over time. I'm just talking about asbestos. So asbestos. Well, you know, the, the sense that I have, um, no evidence at all, is <laughs> that um, you know it was a good thing, and then it's turned into a turn the crank to another one type of a thing, um, and it's not actually having any effect anymore because all the people asbestos are paper. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and the hope with this is that it closes the book, right? Because you'd say the class would be everybody who's been affected by asbestos. Yeah. And then once they receive their settlement, once the class action is done, they're barred for future suit. Right. So, so really, after the first class action, there ought to be nothing left over. Now, we know empirically that's not true. Right. Um, and so it would be interesting to see how people kind of construct new classes around existing classes, the way you do it with patents and claims, right? Yeah, you yeah, kind of work yeah. your way around those. So, so that, that would be interesting, because people don't have a good attitude about that one in particular, and there's some others. I mean, that, the original thing, sure, right? Maybe the original two or three, sure. <laughs> you know. Um, here's, it's um, analyzed this also from a, um, restorative justice perspective, like what different and like you could deter bad behavior, but then also there's like the ability to restore the people who have been harmed, and if these different systems have like differential effects on people who have been harmed, and my kind of like cartoon version of class action is like you get cancer from like a you know dump site, and then you get like a hundred bucks at the end, and I'm not sure, and also whether it's a differential. In our system, whether there's differential, maybe you could kind of address it. You could follow up if you have a good lawyer, I guess. But um, like what <coughs> other inequities in that like, distribution system? And that goes to the heart. There's this huge like legal debate about whether this is about deterrence or whether this is about restorative justice. Mm -hmm. And most people seem to be on the deterrence side. Um, and you actually see like empirically, you could opt out of the class action. Like if you've ever received one of those letters that says you can opt out, and people who opt out do much better than everybody else. Um, which suggests that everybody else isn't really getting the best deal. Um, and so, so that's interesting as well uh, from a restorative perspective. Yeah, so kind of like following up on what a bunch of people have been getting at with the breaking it down into the different types of class, like, you know, environmental products, liability, whatever it is. You know, if you, if you could start creating almost like a dashboard, that could be really interesting to like look at, um, you know, cost, duration, likelihood of success, like success of those who opt out even. Because um, then you could kind of like have like a transparent way of understanding what your rights are, not just as a lawyer, but also as like a consumer um, who could potentially be affected by one of these things. So with the restorative justice, then one of the things that immediately occurs to me is usually the people being sued are not long enough, big enough to do restoration. The only person that can do restoration is the government, because they're the only one that can like put up a trillion dollars a year or whatever. Right? And so, uh, but you can't sue the government. Generally, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there might have to be some different sort of mechanism. Although often these are deep pocketed defendants, BP, Phil Morris. Kind yeah, of I'm thing. just thinking of something where you know all these people die. Okay, well, dying is pretty serious. If a lot of people died, it's much more than a legal company. Or, or like school segregation. Like a school district probably doesn't have money to compensate everybody for the amount that they have set well, them back. And of course, that. you know, a large chunk of the whole population for their whole life. And what, what's the value of that? Well, it's certainly not any one company okay. worth the money. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's also, I guess, a, a time aspect. Because I know, at least, and I, I don't know a lot, <laughs> that uh, the approach a lot of people are taking to, I guess, the opiate crisis is very different because there was some issues with settling tobacco in the 90s. So a lot of the strategies kind of changed for class action over time. So I'm wondering if that comes into play at all. Okay, so there was a big revision in the like 05, um, and we, 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 should, we should segment it by type, and then over time, and then see where the big revisions were, and see if we see that. Yes. Another 
Uh, sorry, just to follow up on that. Um, so one of the things that irritates me about opioids is, is that there are doctors, specific doctors, that uh, just prescribe all sorts of things. Like you can't go to a dentist without coming home with a, a prescription for opioids, which is ludicrous. I, I mean, it's just crazy. But you can't sue all dentists. Could. But it probably wouldn't be a good use of your legal resources. <laughs> <laughs> well, but then, I mean, that's a lot more than, than some particular company. And, so, and also the deterrent value of that would be huge. I think right. what Sunny is saying is normally it's a bunch of people suing one person. Yeah. But yeah. what about the other way where one person can sue a yeah. lot of people? It's called or a cross claim. And the, with class actions, it's not uncommon at all when there's a big defendant in the crosshairs for them to cross claim everybody in town, your suppliers, their partners, people that pass by one day. Awesome. But I wonder if there's <laughs> ever, uh, but for instance, like the opioid thing in particular, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the company is not, I mean, they did all sorts of things, but they were not the ones that prescribed it in the end. I remember going to a dentist's office and, they, and the dentist had put up an ad for, you should ask for opioids <laughs> in the waiting room, right? Yeah. <laughs> but they got any incentive oh. from the pharma. <laughs> As someone who just had a role, so. <laughs> 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 I So it makes you, I wonder, I don't know much about class actions, but I wonder if there could be a class of like tortfeasor or class of defendant. So yeah. you're going after a class of like malfeasant dentists, and then you certify the class based on, I don't know, prescription statistics or something. Probably violate like due process, right? Because you, you have to be served notice. And if it's a class of dentists, an indeterminate class of dentists, the way it's like an indeterminate class of plaintiffs, mm -hmm. you wouldn't they wouldn't all have notice. Like you would have to serve each of them individually and have like proof of service and things like that. So that would be the challenge with with kind of trying to sue. So this is them. also one of these <clears throat> places where the notion of having computational driven law could be really interesting because every one of those dentists has a uh, certification. And pays taxes in a particular way, and you know, all these other sort of government things. So you know exactly who they are. And in another completely different database, there's who wrote the prescription for what. You would also, I mean, you would swap legal, so it would be fascinating. If, if you found a way to just like bring all of these, like sue all dentists who have, you know, encouraged people to buy. Well, but you use very contextual stuff to exactly. put together the case, do the notice, et cetera, et cetera, right? And file like 10,000 cases, right? Yeah. And that would be interesting. I don't know how the legal system would react. <laughs> but a human doesn't have to actually look at all of that. A judge, right? Under the current system, so you you create, you file it all, you could do that computationally. Right. And then a human judge would sit down and say, okay, now where do I start? Well, don't the judge, I mean, doesn't the judge sort of like look through them and say, yeah, it looks mostly okay, right? But they can't check anybody. I mean, they have a hearing, like potentially, yeah. they'd be a hearing for each of them. I mean, you, it would be really, really potentially, right? or they, yeah. or they would yeah. say, you know what? Let's have some of this computational law stuff to deal with. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That's, uh, that's the that's the hope. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I mean, from the group's point of view, this sort of thing where you could really have very different dynamics to it is really interesting. I mean, I'm going to get on my. my Podium for a little bit here. So, so, you know, if you go and you hang out with the ABA guys and talk about access to justice, it's pretty wonderful. But in fact, people like us, uh, you don't have access to justice because you can't afford it. Right? You have to be part of a class action or somebody else is paying for it or, or go bang somebody to be pro bono or something. So, so, that's one of the things that you're going to see, I think, with the computational law is that you have the ability to change the, the dynamics of the hurdles in the law system in a way that may be very different than what you have now. Well, we, we'd have to be careful, right? Because if yeah. you do sue all dentists and then nobody can get their molars pulled because the dentists are all fast. It's a problem. That's a problem. <laughs> in, the, in law, it's my impression that like, so, like a lot of the decisions that come down to like this Kind of human feel like reasonability would a reasonable dentist have given opioids to this person and that's why like people can appeal to this like a human person must look at this it can't be computational so i'm just curious what you think about those like kind of 
um, idea than what I see as the law, which seems to be very, very much about, like, you can't put numbers on this, it's about what a reasonable person is. So the party line is that the reasonable person standard is an objective standard. Um, okay. And <laughs> You can fall <laughs> um, but but that, that that would be an objective standard, um, and that you know we look at custom and we look at you know what would most dentists do. We ask ten dentists, well, what would you have done? Um, and also, we'll pay you like an expert witness fee um, <laughs> and things like that. So you know the interesting thing would be that trying to do it computationally, like representing the reasonable person computationally yeah. would probably be more in line with what, what the legal fiction is mm -hmm. um, than what is actually happening. <laughs> what I'm told is, is that increasingly what you're seeing is you're seeing computational methods looking at cases and saying this one is going to go this way, that one is going to go this way. So in the sort of automated discovery process, you get to a point where you can say 97% of the time, you're going to be granted this or this has been made illegal in France. Um, to, to run analytics on the way judges are going to act um, has been outlawed. This time. Really? really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. So, probably means it works. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably <laughs> means it works. There's a court in Germany, I think, that outlawed like automated use of anything in cases, which is kind of like. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, they can't sue Google. Uh, probably it would be difficult for them. because they're, they're about computation. So yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> so I guess one one point that's interesting to me is that I read like if you want, maybe one or two years ago that a lot of companies are putting in their terms that you cannot class action sue them anymore. Mm -hmm. Sure. So does that mean class action is kind of going away or because you're signing off the ability to do that and in some cases you have to like. You can't even sue companies anymore. Like Chase sent me a letter saying they're, they're setting up like an arbitration system. I can sue them, but they choose who the arbitration is, which means like they're gonna choose somebody who decides for them. Yeah, I mean, arbitration is like this big hot topic, right? And you have it everywhere, um, including like all employment contracts and stuff. Uh, I don't know, I don't know if it's been litigated. Like the bad, they can say whatever they want in the contract, right? They can say you can't bring a class action, but you can still try and see where it goes. And I think that like with the BP case, the people who were suing were the <laughs> clients of BP, right? They didn't sign anything. Right. And so I don't see, I mean, maybe some people couldn't have sued BP because mm -hmm. they like owned like, you know, some asset that was from BP. But for the most part, like these are third parties. And I so see. it would be hard to ban it. The only thing about the arbitration is, is that often it's a good thing in other contexts than it's in like this particular thing because it's immediate, you know, drag on for years, it doesn't cost a lot of money. It, they tend to be, they can be fair. I don't know all the statistics about it. But it's not, you know, necessarily bad. It's not necessarily bad. It reduces stress on the legal system, right? So, so if they're choosing who the arbiter is, that's like, oh yeah. But, but you know, if there's some sort of fair arbitration right. thing now, uh, I mean, my view would be is, is that if it's, you know, more than one standard deviation out, uh, from an arbitration point of view, you don't get to bring a lawsuit because you know it's pretty clear, mm -hmm. and it's only in the gray area. Yeah, I mean, it kind of gets into the concept of online dispute resolution generally. Like, uh, there there are places that have implemented like schemes for like civil claims for online or uh, for disputes, and you can just go online, you fill out all the information, and it delivers the judgment like automatically. Mm. And um, there, there's that uh, group from Australia who came and did the legal hackers thing here. And um, I think they did uh, some report where over some period of time, they went through like 600,000 cases with this system. Whereas in the past with like the same amount of time devoted to judges, um, they would have gotten through like 4,000 cases. Yeah. And so it was, it, there, there stands like to be this like incredible efficiency gain. And I think, uh, you know, just like taking the discussion from something that's static and like reframing it as something that's dynamic and computational will get people to see more of the utility of it. In fact, um, I, I was an online dispute uh, resolution arbitrator for domain names versus trademarks for a few years. One of the interesting things about arbitration is there's a lot more um, capability in a voluntary way to set the, the uh, process. And so it does need to be fair and get a neutral third party arbitration. 
arbitrator and things like that. But you can design the like the civil procedure for filing it and the workflow and everything so that it goes through like a platform. So to test computational law in a legal context like this, it actually might be better to start with arbitration where you could very quickly design and deploy a system that can be computational that could maybe over time be adopted by public courts that don't move so fast. So you're saying using arbitration as sort of the test bed for a lot of this stuff. Well, that seems yeah. like perfectly reasonable. Because it's a much lighter weight system, basically. Mm -hmm. It's less constrained by tradition. You can just have a few parties agree to do it a different method, and then you can do it that way. Yeah, freedom of contract. I think about that a lot when it comes to like data, the idea of like data and data and property law. Right, because like one of one of the issues when I talk to people about the idea of like data ownership laws is the idea that all sort of uh, litigation or insert action that's going to do with property or like data property is going to have to go through these kinds of claims courts that are already choked, right? Where like you're not really actually going to get anything done. So people have been talking about how do you set up like you know forced arbitration agreements between consumers and providers when they're like holding data as property. Or when they like violate an agreement that you had about how your data was going to be used by the platform, um, and all of that could be completely automated. Right? It's a perfect fit for personal data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes so that's a great place to start. Yeah. I mean, generally, the financial area is a great place too. I mean, it's all digital, and you sort of know what the outcome is. And it's the number. <laughs> that's not what I'm arguing. Yeah. Thank okay, you so this is a really rich discussion. I appreciate it. Yes. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So let's see. Um, we're not the the computational law thing is not open, right?